Shalom and welcome to the Heartland Connection. This is Zach Waller, the Executive Director of Hayovel, your host, coming to you guys straight from the heartland of Israel. So Sukkot is here. It's uh, been an amazing week, starting off the week, building our sukkah, finishing up our uh, little uh, temporary dwelling here. Our uh, sukkah turned out really well. It's really amazing to do sukkot here in the land of Israel because you go to, you know, Rami Levy's or whatever, you know, the grocery store here, and it's just, you know, there's like a whole aisle section where there's all these kind of, you know, um, fake fruits that you can hang up and all kinds of, you know, huge banners of the temple or like, you know, all this stuff that you can decorate your sukkah with, all different kinds of twinkle lights and, and uh, you know, different color lights and all this kind of stuff that you can put up. So um, Becca and the boys and I had a really awesome time the first part of this week getting all of our um, stuff ready and finishing off our sukkah, putting up our the walls around our uh, uh, pergola basically here and then you know, finishing it out, uh, building our sukkah and then entering into the feast. Of course, we had our, our lulav already with our etrog and uh, all these different things. I actually got to go to um, Romney Levy's to pick up the Lulavim for all of our uh, uh, volunteers and stuff, everybody that wanted one. And uh, so I was actually able to go and pick out a Etrog um, that uh, was really huge, nice one. is like, a, I don't know, 10 inches tall and about four or five inches thick and uh, really nice big Etrog. And uh, to rejoice with for the feast. So that was really special. Uh, and so, yeah, this first couple mornings of Sukkot, we've, we've gotten our uh, lulav together and gone through the Amidah prayers. And then uh, um, we've sung through the Hallel, the Hallel Psalms, and rejoice with them with the, uh, with the lulav. So it's really amazing. We have like you know, 150 volunteers here. So we're all inside this huge sukkah that we've built here on the uh, on site here at the base in Israel and we're all jumping up and down rejoicing and singing and it's just kind of surreal it's like wow like this is actually happening right now that the nations are here and we're able to celebrate in the land of Israel with these the produce of the land it's just really really amazing we'll actually talk a little more about that in a little bit uh, speaking of the Hallel Psalms, uh, Braden and Tally are still working on those. Some of you guys have seen the Psalms of Ascent uh, CD that we put together a little while ago. Um, so the Hallel Psalms are uh, almost finished. Um, Braden and Tally have been working on them for a couple years now. So keep your eyes out. Those should be ready here within the next uh, month or two anyways. You know, it'll take a little bit of time to get the... Um, <clears throat> get them produced into CDs and all that, make them available. But keep your eyes out for that. They should be coming soon. Um, so this Shabbat is actually a uh, very special Shabbat. There's not we don't follow the the pattern of the weekly portion. It's actually a special Sukkot portion. Um, we're reading from a couple different places throughout Sukkot. We'll be reading from uh, Exodus 33, uh, verse 12 through chapter 34, verse 26, and um, basically this is uh, goes through the the account of where um, God, uh, Moshe asked God to reveal Himself to him and God says well I'll reveal my back and then and then this whole really um, interesting story of how God reveals himself and then there's this whole thing of God of Moshe saying you know God you have to go with us uh, through the desert because because God's like you know you guys it was, it was right after the whole incident with the golden calf and God's like look I'll send an angel with you and Moshe's like no if you don't go with us we can't go so there's this whole idea of like God's um, presence being with the people of Israel. And um, as I was reading through that, I was just really uh, thinking about how amazing it is that we serve a God who wants to walk with us, right? Getting back to the Garden of Eden, you know, being that place where we can walk with God in the garden, being that place where we can have a relationship with him, like that's what, that's his desire. And, um, and Moshe, Moses knows that. He knows that this is what we're all shooting for. So he's like, God, we have to, we have to figure this out, whatever it takes. Yes, we've just made a horrific mistake in this golden calf incident, but we want to be with you. And as we're celebrating Sukkot, we're you know putting together this booth 
And really, it's a time to think about this, about how, you know, sometimes we get kind of comfortable in the four walls of our home. But if we go outside of that, out into the open, build a little temporary dwelling, then it's like, okay, we're out with God, right? We're in God's presence. It's like coming out from our comfort zone a little bit uh, and just recognizing that God is um, in this world, that God is here. And uh, by going out into our sukkah, we're kind of like coming together into God's presence and the whole idea of tabernacling um, with God. And, you know, there's there's a lot of teaching about how the different festivals uh, will be fulfilled in different ways that, um, you know, we as Christians believe that on the Passover, that Yeshua came was a sacrifice like the Passover lamb during Passover and then Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came. Um, and there's a lot of things that point to the fact that Rosh Hashanah, Yom Tru, will be the day of blasting, the day of the Lord when Yeshua returns. And then Yom Kippur, like the Judgment Day, and then Tabernacles like the, is like the wedding feast, right? The wedding feast that we're all waiting for. So there's so much there, and there's a, there's a lot of teaching on that out there, so I won't go into that um, too much. But if you haven't studied into that, I really encourage you. It's a very, very uh, amazing study. And seeing how these different festivals uh, will be, ha- have been, or will be fulfilled, and just this whole concept of how the Feast of Tabernacles is a time where we really focus in on God uh, and us coming together, of us being able to be in the presence of God, for God to tabernacle among us, and we see that through the uh, the story of the Exodus, you know, God delivers the people from Egypt. Um, and then they get a mikvah in the Red Sea, right? And then they be given the instructions on Mount Sinai. And then the tabernacle is made where God's presence comes in amongst his people. He can dwell with his people. And so now we have our mini tabernacles during the Feast of Tabernacles where we're with, you know, in God's presence. So it's just such a powerful concept that we could be, that we could come into God's presence. It's an amazing thing. So another one of the scriptures we read in Sukkot is Numbers 29, verse 17 through 34. And uh, that's the whole section there talking about the different sacrifices that are made um, during Sukkot. Um, And it's interesting that uh, one thing is that there are 70 bulls sacrificed during Sukkot. And the number 70 uh, in the Bible, and um, it's a very common uh, idea in in a lot of uh, Jewish thought, is that 70 represents the nations. And so this Feast of Tabernacles, which you know, according to Zechariah, will be when the nations come up to uh, Jerusalem to celebrate the feast and to praise God, um, that there's very much a international, a nation's connection with the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's interesting that there are even feasts already set up from the very beginning, or I'm sorry, sacrifices that are already set up from the very beginning that will be a feast, I guess, <laughs> um, for the nations to come up and, um, and celebrate. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then we have uh, Leviticus uh, portion here, chapter 22, verse 26 to chapter 23, verse 44. And um, here in verse 40 of chapter 23, it talks about how to celebrate. It's kind of interesting because you're going through all the different feasts and then it, you get to kind of what seems like the end. And it says, you know, and these are the feasts of the Lord, and that you celebrate, you know, every year or whatever. And then all of a sudden it goes, oh, and by the way, on the 15th day of the seventh month, uh, here's a few, little bit more instruction. And so in verse 40 it says, uh, And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So here we have these four different things that you're supposed to take and rejoice before the Lord. And so that's where the uh, lulav comes from. Um, that's where this whole idea that you know, you'll see the Jewish people with this um, kind of different branches in their hand and then this big yellow etrog, and they'll hold them together and they'll do different prayers and stuff. You, you know, see them at the Western Wall, um, different places where they are uh, doing their prayers with this thing called a lulav. The lulav is actually um, what the palm branch is called. Um, if this is called the lulav, and since it's like the biggest, tallest piece, then the whole set is actually also called the lulav. Uh, so it's just the palm branch. And then you have um, the all, all four pieces. So, so number one, you have the etrog. And the etrog is um, a lemon-like... Uh, citrus fruit, and uh, this is what uh, they use when the scripture there we just read where it says, um, 
the product of goodly trees. Um, this is what they um, use for that. So it could be anywhere from like the size of an egg. I've seen one that was like the size, I was like literally almost as big as a basketball, maybe like a soccer ball size, uh, just huge ones. So you'll find all different sizes. Um, like I said, the one that I was able to find at uh, in the store here is probably about 10 inches long. And um, so, yeah, it's we found really nice. And then there's this little thing on the top called a pitome. And uh, they're supposed to be really valuable if they have this little thing on top. And I'm sure there's a lot of symbolism stuff behind that. But um, some of you guys may have seen the video Ushpazim, which means like visitors or guests. Uh, and it's a video about Sukkot. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to watch it. It's kind of a Fiddler on the Roofish kind of video where it has lots of Jewish culture and you can learn a lot about the Jewish people and customs and things like that. And it's a really pretty a meaningful video. I don't usually uh, recommend movies, but that's one that you might find interesting if you like movies. It's uh, very clean and all that. Um, so yeah, in that, in that movie, uh, he goes, uh, this guy in the movie goes to the store to find a, a, a etrog and he's like picking all through the different ones. He's got a magnifying glass out and you, you should see him like you, all the stores right before Sukkot. They're like looking at them all. They find one little blemish like, ah, oh, they'll put that down, grab another one and like look and then they'll tell the guy, oh, it should cost less because it's got this blemish or that blemish or whatever. And, uh, so it's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy watching uh, these guys go through and, and look for their uh, their etrog. Um, <clears throat> so that's the etrog. They say that uh, there actually is a acronym because the word etrog is uh, Aleph, Tav, Resh, Vav, Gimel. And so if you do a um, acronym for that, it actually could mean faith, which is Emunah. Repentance with his teshuva, healing with his refuah, and redemption, which is geula. Um, so it's really interesting to have those four things, which also we have four species we're using here. So to have those four things could bring a lot of meaning behind that etrog as well. Then we have the lulav, the palm branch. Um, it's, it's, used like, it's like a, just a palm frond, a straight. Um, palm branch that's used um, and there's the, each one of them has so much symbolism you know some people they say that uh, each one represents a different thing because you have the etrog which uh, smells has a really beautiful smell really 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 sweet good smell to it and you can also eat it like a lemon um, then you have the myrtle uh, which smells but doesn't have any you know you can't eat it and then you have the willow which doesn't have a smell and you can't eat it and then you have the um, the palm, which you can eat the dates from the palm tree, but it doesn't have any smell. So they're saying that all well, these different different types of people. Some people, you know, have these different get things. And, and during Sukkot, we're bringing everybody all together to this unification of everyone, all different shapes and sizes and smells and tastes and like all this stuff. And it's like a, a unifying time of bringing everybody together. Another thing about the uh, myrtle, which was hadas in Hebrew, um, it has uh, like the, its leaves are like the shape of eyes, and so that could symbolize like seeing or vision. Um, so there's all kinds of different things that uh, that that, are, that these things symbolize. They have the uh, the willow tree, the arava, uh, which um, also <coughs> excuse me. Um, also, the word arava or aravot is also which is translated in Psalm 68 says, "Extol whom who rides on the clouds." Um, like, praise him who, who rides on the clouds. And the word for clouds there is aravot. It's the same word as the willows. And so there's a lot, a lot of meaning behind that too. Like we're praising God, we're rejoicing uh, before God in the sukkah, and like extolling Him on the clouds with our arava. Um. So there's lots of special prayers and blessings to um, the Shehechianu, they said, uh, during Sukkot. Whenever you come um, to the beginning of a holiday, into a new season, a lot of times this one's, or if you do something for the first time for that year, uh, like if you're eating a certain fruit that just became ripe and it's the first time for that year, you could say the blessing, or um, there's quite a few different ones you can where you can say the blessing, but um, the blessing goes... That's a traditional beginning. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. And then it goes, Shehechianu Vekimanu Vehigianu Lazman Hazeh. 
which uh, the translation for that is, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and brought us to this season. Uh, so there's a little tune that uh, we usually do for it. It goes, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehechianu Vekimanu Vehigianu Lazman Hazeh this is one of our uh, favorite blessings. It's just something really special about like entering into a new season after all you've been through the last year. And then it's like, thank you, God, for bringing us to this season and this part of the journey. It's very special. Um, so another one of the uh, readings that we do um, for Sukkot is Deuteronomy 16. Um, it's another section of scripture where it talks about the feasts. And... Um, in verse 13 of chapter 16, it says, You shall keep the feast of Sukkot for seven days when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and from your wine press. So it's really interesting that uh, actually <laughs> I've got my overalls on here. This morning I was actually out in the field harvesting grapes. And um, so here's some of the uh, fruit of the land here. We were just harvesting this morning. They've kind of shriveled up a little bit since I picked them um, this morning. But, uh, like, literally, it's pretty awesome to be here in the land of Israel and to go and bring in the harvest and then go up to the feast. Like, it's exactly what it says right here uh, in Deuteronomy. It's like, you know, you're gathered in the produce from your threshing floor, your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, who are within your towns, like everybody, everybody's included in this, nobody's left out, everybody's supposed to rejoice before the Lord for his great provision that he's given. Um, it says, for seven days you shall keep the feast of the Lord your God at the place that Hashem will choose, so go up to Jerusalem, uh, because the Lord your God will bless you and all your produce and all the work of your hands so that you will be all together joyful. So like, we got rejoice and joyful. It's like, it's like this commandment, like you gotta be happy. Um, and it's directly related to the produce, that last part there too, last part of 15, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you'll be altogether joyful. So we're bringing the produce. So what's really crazy is for 2,000 years, there hasn't been this produce to rejoice with at the feast. Like it's been um, this season of desolation for 2,000 years, and now all of a sudden, here we are in the land of Israel and experiencing this. And and it's there's just so many pieces that are like all coming together because we have the verses in Zechariah 14 where it says the nations will come and celebrate the feast, right? We know specifically the nations are going to come and celebrate the, the, the festival of Sukkot. Um, and then we have uh, Jeremiah 31, 5. It says that vineyards will be planted on the mountains of Samaria. So we know that vines are going to be here. And that part of celebrating the feast, as we just read in Deuteronomy 16, is to celebrate with the produce. And specifically in Isaiah 61, 5, it talks about the nations, the foreigners coming and being specifically your vine dressers. That's what's kind of interesting. It's not just your produce. It's like the, the, like all these verses. <laughs> Deuteronomy 16 talks about your wine press, you know, so specifically talking about grapes, right? Jeremiah 31, 5, vineyards will be planted. Isaiah 61, 5, you know, foreigners will be your vine dressers. So like the grape thing is something really, really significant about this grape thing and the wine thing. And it's all tied into Sukkot because foreigners are supposed to come and be part of the harvest and foreigners, people from the nation, are supposed to come up for the Feast of Tabernacles. And what's crazy is it's happening right now. <laughs> like, this is real. Like, nations are coming up. Um, you know, there's always this huge, huge uh, festival that the ICJ puts on where there's, like, people from all over the world coming um, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And then we're bringing all these people in from all over the world to be part of the bringing in the harvest and then g going up to the feast. The vineyards have been planted. And, and it's real. Like, there's grapes here on the mountains of Samaria right now in our time. And it's just like, whoa, this is real. Like, it's really happening. It's an incredible time to be alive. So, so amazing. Then we have uh, one last scripture that I'd like to uh, mention here that's common to read during Sukkot is Ecclesiastes. And it's kind of interesting um, because we wouldn't necessarily think of 
Ecclesiastes to be a book we would read during a season of joy, right? It's like, you know, it's kind of like a vanity, vanity, all is vanity and all these things. And, um, but it's kind of going back to that idea of, of leaving our place of comfort and going out and meeting God in our sukkah, tabernacling with him, kind of recognizing that our lives are temporary and, you know, kind of understanding that more because that's the conclusion, right? And at the end of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, it says the conclusion of the matter, you know, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So it's like kind of peeling off everything else. And, uh, and maybe this kind of helps us too, as we're rejoicing in the feast to realize why we're rejoicing. We're not just having a party. We're not just, you know, um, having nice food and, and, uh, drinking wine and, and having a big party. Like we're rejoicing because we have a fear of God and we keep his commandments and he has blessed us with abundant provision and so many things that we don't deserve, uh, so many things that we just want, we don't really need, so many uh, relationships and all these special things um, that we often take for granted and that's what we should be rejoicing about. We should be rejoicing for all these blessings that God has given us. And especially since we just came through Rosh Hashanah, where we're coronating God as king, and then Yom Kippur, where there's like this time of judgment, and we know that God is merciful, and then uh, tabernacling with him, like there is kind of this fear of God and this recognition, and then being able to rejoice in that um, is really powerful. So this is, it kind of, Ecclesiastes, I guess, kind of helps set the tone for how to rejoice and why we're rejoicing. Um, something really interesting is that, you know, Ecclesiastes is written by King Solomon, um, something that I just recently heard, uh, that was so powerful, you know, in English it says that, uh, you know, Solomon had this whole thing where he, he, God asked him what he wanted, and, and in English it says, in our English translations, it says he, that Solomon asked for wisdom, and it's in First Kings chapter 3. Well, uh, in Hebrew, the word for wisdom is chokhmah. And that's not the word that's used in this place. It actually says Lev Shomea. Uh, King Shlomo, King Solomon, asked for a Lev Shomea. Lev is heart, and Shomea means hearing or being being able to listen and hear. And so a Lev Shomea means a listening heart. So that's a little bit different than just wisdom. Um, this is like actually having a heart that's able to hear from God. So... Um, you know, I was just like, wow, that's what, you know, I really want. And I think what we should all be asking God for, um, and able to understand all these amazing things that he's given us is to be able to have a heart that listens, you know, not to be able to try to analyze things on our own. You know, I'm, I'm a very analytic person. I, uh, you know, try to, uh, think things through and plan things out and all this. And, you know, sometimes I'm just like, okay, there's 150 million ways to to do this or to think this through or to analyze this. I just want to hear from God. You know, I just want to have a listening heart, a lev shomea, um, so that I can walk in the right thing. You know, there may be a whole ton of good things. There may be a whole ton of different ways, but I want to know what the right way is and be able to walk in that. And uh, so that would be my prayer for you guys during this festival of Sukkot during this uh, season of our joy is that you would be able to have a Lev Shomea, that you'd be able to rejoice in the feast knowing what we have to rejoice about and the magnitude of God's mercy and his kindness towards us, his provision that he's given to us, knowing that it's from him, not of anything of our own, and that we would be able to recognize the miraculous things that God is doing right now in our time in the land of Israel through the, the redemption, this restoration that's happening here, um, that we'd be able to bless him, that we'd be able to rejoice in our uh, Sukkot, and uh, that uh, God would bless us with a heart to be able to listen, a Lev Shomea. And uh, so may God bless each one of you with a wonderful, wonderful Sukkot, with a Lev Shomea. Thanks so much for listening, and Shabbat Shalom from the beautiful, exceedingly good land of Israel. Israel.